On this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast, I'll be talking about Marjorie the Medium's Grave, another segment of Houdini Radio, and some recollections of uh, my friend Steve Baker, Mr. Escape. That and more on Episode 3 of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode three of the Magic Detective Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie, and uh, here we go again, episode number three. I'm kind of getting the the hang of this, although uh, we're still figuring out some things as we go along. Uh, So the uh, first podcast I had mentioned on episode two that uh, I was banning the word magic history, at least temporarily, because I had said it like 300 times on the first episode. So um, I'm going to try not to say it so much, but... I also discovered that I say the word cool a whole lot, so I'm going to try and curb that as well. It's amazing what audio does to uh, to make you uh, see all the bad habits that you have verbally. It's pretty wild. Um, so episode two, I mentioned something called the six degrees of separation, or what I call the, the six degrees of separation magic style. I got to thinking about it a little bit more. The Abraham Lincoln connection was really interesting to me. If you want to find out, just check out episode two. But I was thinking about another connection, uh, historical connection that I have to somebody pretty famous, and that would be Wyatt Earp. And uh, Wyatt Earp, the legendary lawman uh, from the Wild West. The connection I have to him is actually much closer than the Lincoln connection. And that connection goes like this. Uh, It starts with my friend Steve Baker, uh, the escape artist, and it goes from Steve Baker to Roy Earp. Now, Roy was the son of Wyatt Earp, so that's two, and then you go one more, and you're at Wyatt Earp. So it's just only three degrees of separation between me and Wyatt Earp. That is just phenomenal, crazy to think about. Uh, I just challenge you to do the same thing. Just kind of see who in uh, history you might be connected to, how closely you may be connected to. I know when I was working on uh, the ancestry for my family, it was astonishing to me how, uh, as, as you go through it, the, the different people you're, you're connected to. So, I mean, some families, uh, not mine that I have discovered, but some families are related to, you know, famous historical figures. So that's, uh, that's always fascinating when you discover something like that. Uh, I'm a big advocate of Ancestry.com, even though they're not paying me to say that, but I am. I just love that. I was actually able to trace back part of my family tree all the way to the 1500s, which is uh, mind-boggling if you think about it. Let me talk a little bit, though, about uh, this fellow Steve Baker. Now, Steve was um, a controversial figure because, uh, really because of just his nature. He could be the nicest man on the planet, and he could be uh, (laughs) very confrontational. So uh, just, I guess it just decided, uh, decides um, which Steve you happen to run into. Um, I never, ever, in the whole time that I knew Steve, never had a problem. We never had an argument. Didn't really disagree on very much. He was my escape mentor. Uh, there's kind of a funny story about that. He had done a lecture for the Magic Castle, and he performed something there called the tug-of-war rope tie. It's his own creation, his own version of escaping from um, having your wrists tied with rope. His, his, uh, his escape really appealed to me. I thought it was uh, very clever. And he didn't teach it that I know of. Um, I uh, figured out how to do it figured out a method of doing it. And then I contacted Mark Cannon, who uh, was a, um, Mark's not in the, I guess he's no longer in the escape business, but uh, he's a great guy. He lives in California. He's a police officer there, but he was big into escapes for a number of years and ran an escape company. And uh, Mark mentioned to me, he goes, oh, well, this is the technique that Steve used. And he mentioned it. And I was like, well, that's, that's, pretty wild because that's not what I'm doing. So I was able to contact Steve. I was able to get in touch with him. And uh, we talked. um, I remember the first time we talked on the phone, we must have talked for like three hours. And the tug of war rope tie thing came up. And um, I mentioned to him that um, I had done it. I had figured it out. And he said, well, you know, you may have figured out a way of doing it. You probably didn't figure out my way. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll send you a video. 
So I sent him a video and he uh, called me up when he got the video and he goes, Carnegie, I can't believe it. You have figured out my tug of war rope tie. This is, uh, he's like, I have only taught it to one person um, who was Tony Clark uh, at the time. He said, I've only taught it to one person. He said, now two people know my, uh, my tug of war rope tie. And I think he eventually taught it also to uh, escape artist Andrew Basso, who's touring with the show called The Illusionists, which is a great show. So, um, but Steve was a character. He was just, I just, uh, like I said, I got the biggest kick out of him. We were really good friends and talked all the time. They were there for a while. We talked practically every day. Um, I helped him with his website. I helped him. uh, We were kind of working on a sort of a biography for him at one point. And uh, so I had tons and tons of notes and he would send me stuff. He'd send me, you know, copies of press clippings and that kind of thing. And um, just so I'd have, you know, the historical record for the various escapes he did. And I always thought of Steve as, you know, just the escape artist. And uh, it was amazing to me to find out that he did a, a mentalism show. He did a comedy magic show. He even did an illusion show, which I had no idea. I, I know, also, I had always assumed that his name, his performing name was Steve Baker. Steve Baker, Mr. Escape, and come to find out that he actually originally went by the name the Great Gerhardt, which, if you ask me, that's a terrible name, but not, you know, no offense to anybody whose last name is Gerhardt, it's just not the Great Gerhardt, just sounds more like a comedy act than it does a, you know, a magician or a, or an escape artist. He didn't keep it very long, but um, I, I thought that was pretty interesting as well. Uh, let me see. Can I tell you anything um, really crazy about Steve? I mean, I have so many Steve Baker stories. It's, it's. Um, I'll be talking about him quite often. I think on the. Um, oh, this came up the other day, and and I and actually relates to C- to Steve as well. Somebody asked me about the Magic Detective YouTube show because a number of years ago I had a Magic Detective YouTube show, which. Uh, was terrible. It was awful. I'm coming right out front saying that. It, I think the first episode was good, but the biggest problem was is uh, I was trying to do a TV production with a terrible video camera, and I could never get the lighting right, and it was always kind of out of focus, and I was never happy with it. So I'd shoot like three or four episodes and close it down, and then I'd want to do it again and try it again, and it just never got it right. So uh, I do want to bring that back, actually, now that I've got a better camera and certainly more knowledge in uh, how to do these kind of things. But if you go on YouTube and you type in the Magic Detective or just Magic Detective, you'll find um, you'll find episode one and episode one is about Steve. And what it is, it's he gave me the video footage of an escape that he did in Caracas, Venezuela, back in the 70s. He was presenting an escape called Trial by Fire. Now, what this is, is a, it's a big, uh, it's kind of like a teepee. Um, the one he had, it was like a teepee made of plywood. And there would be a, uh, inside of it, there'd be a like a stock or uh, of some kind that he would be strapped to or chained to, and they put a hood over him, and then the, this teepee went around him, and they were supposed to uh, put a chemical on it so they could light it on fire. Well, you've got to check out the video because it's just well, what's the word horrific. You have to check it out, and I'll tell you about it uh, at another time. Uh, I'll tell you the whole story. In fact, if you watch the episode, I tell the whole story there. But I encourage you to check that out because, like I said, episode one is the best episode that I did of the uh, the YouTube show, and I will eventually be bringing it back. But hopefully, I have uh, you know fifty Magic Detective podcasts under my belt by then. It's time now for the Magic History Minute, where I give you a really cool bit of trivia in a minute's time. October 16th, 1932, marked the birth of Cesario Palaez. Now, if you're not familiar with Cesario, well, you may have heard of his show. He was the creator of the Le Grand David show in Beverly, Massachusetts. It's the longest running, uh, continuous running magic show in history. And it was 
they own their own theater. Actually, uh, the company owned two different theaters, the Cabot Street Cinema Theater and the Larkham Theater right down the street from there. And Cesario was an incredible stage mag magician. He was also a, a college professor as well. And he had this concept of putting together this big magic show from seeing as a kid, seeing shows like Fu Manchu's show, David Bamberg's show, uh, Chang and, and other magicians. Uh, Cesario was from Cuba and he immigrated here to the United States. Actually, he basically escaped Cuba because he was escaping Castro's regime. And that was uh, Cuba's loss and our uh, good fortune that he came here. And uh, so that's our Magic History Minute. Happy birthday, Cesario. We miss you. Cesario passed away a couple of years ago, but I think of him often. In fact, I'm right now in my office here, I'm looking at a poster, a La Grande David poster, uh, the 25th uh, year anniversary, which was back in 2002. Uh, this poster painted by the great artist Rick Heath, who was a member of the company. Uh, you know what? Actually, in the future, I will get Rick to do an interview on the show. I know he'll do it for me. And uh, so uh, that's something we can look forward to. So happy birthday, Cesario. Now I, I'd like to mention something I'm very fascinated by, and that is the graves of uh, dead magicians. I guess the fascination comes from seeing all the pictures of Houdini standing next to these various magicians' graves. And somewhere along the way, I decided, hey, I could check these out too. There's no law says I can't. So I started doing that. And a few years ago, actually two years ago, when I attended the Yankee gathering for the first time in the, Bo in the Boston area, we got there a day early and I thought, well, you know what, let's go do something before the, the convention really gets going. So we went into town and I, I actually, I have another website that is, uh, records the locations of dead magicians, basically. <laughs> and the, the website is called Dead Conjurers dot blogspot.com and I, don't, I can't even tell you how many magicians I have on there it's not a complete list by any stretch of the imagination but I do have quite a few magicians listed there and where their graves can be found so I knew that Marjorie the medium the famous medium that went up against Harry Houdini I knew Marjorie was buried in Boston I knew this because my my old friend Norman Bigelow told me and he actually sent me pictures of when he visited, he searched it out and found Marjorie's grave. And he's got a couple pictures of the grave that he, he sent me. So those were the original pictures I had on my dead conjurer's blog. And then while we were up there, I thought, well, let's just go see if we can find it ourselves. Cause I, I had a map that he gave me as well. So we went up and Marjorie is buried in Forest Hills Cemetery in Boston. And if, again, if you go to my website, which is deadconjurers.blogspot.com, and you look up Marjorie the Medium, you'll see the map that's on there. You'll see the exact location of uh, where the grave is. Now, the day that we went up, it was a rainy day. We, we were able to go in, park the car, walk around. I, I knew where the grave was supposed to be, but it wasn't there according to the map that I had. And we started walking around and looking and going from grave to grave to grave. We covered a lot of ground, let me tell you. Couldn't find Marjorie's grave. And I think we were there for over an hour looking for uh, the, the, the tombstone and coming up empty, coming up with nothing. Finally, I was about to give up. And I, my assistant Denise was with me and I, I turned to her and I said, you know what? I don't think we're going to find it. And I, at that very moment, I was leaning against a tombstone that, I, you know, standing next to it and put my hand on it. And I looked and I'm like, wait a minute. Here it is. This one that I'm leaning on, the one I'm touching was Marjorie's grave. I think Marjorie's real name was Mina Crandon. And the gravestone, uh, this particular gravestone that she, where she's buried says Stinson at the top that's her maiden name so that's what that's what i think that's why we missed it because we were looking for crandon and here's the stinson grave but if we and it was covered with moss the whole thing was covered with green moss and you couldn't see any of the writing on it so i don't know if you're supposed to do it but we did it we wiped the moss away and sure enough 
there she was. She was several down, but she it, it says Mina Stinson Crandon, and um, and I believe her husband was also on there as well. If oh oh no 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 maybe it's not the husband, it's the her brother Walter her Walter. So if you know anything about the the Houdini and Marjorie battles, when Marjorie would contact the spirits, she would go through her deceased brother Walter. So Walter's buried there as well. So it's kind of a very fascinating, interesting little thing. I, I, I get a kick out of this. We, a couple of years ago, was it a couple of years ago? Or was it last year? No, it was, two, it was the year that I did the, the Ted talk in, in Washington. Uh, after we finished the Ted talk, um, I knew there was a cemetery in town where, uh, Henry Ridgely Evans was buried. I knew where I knew the, I had the, uh, the address to the cemetery, but I'd never been there before. So we, after I, we finished the Ted talk, we drove over to the cemetery. And again, you know, what are the chances? There was a rainy day that day too, when we parked the car and walked into the cemetery and, and oh my gosh, that is the biggest cemetery. It's very hilly and it's kind of dangerous because a lot of it is, um, there's some like shale sidewalks and when they get wet, they're treacherous to say the least. And I, I had, uh, the location of where the, the, the grave was supposed to be, but the cemeteries were so poorly marked that you couldn't find anything. We, we walked around forever and eventually we found it. It was on the complete end of the cemetery and the, you know, near there's a, like a lake of water that kind of divides the cemetery from, the road and it was right near there and I was so glad when we found it but boy it was uh, it was a chore to discover soaking wet by the time we got there but but we were, were able to uh, to find it and then coincidentally enough next to the cemetery is a house where Evans when he was younger when he was in his 20s performed at this house. And I'll share that story with you, uh, in the future. I want to do a little bit more on Henry Ridgely Evans, uh, down the road. So I'll share that story with you, uh, at another time. But, um, if you're interested in checking out graves and you live in the DC area, Henry Ridgely Evans is a, is another, um, well, he's a magic celebrity of sorts that lives, uh, or is buried here in our area. Let me see if I can tell you the actual name of the cemetery. It is Oak Hill Cemetery in the Georgetown area of Washington, D.C. His grave is in the Stewart section, plot 610, although that will mean absolutely nothing <laughs> because it's not marked at all. So if you want to go try and find it, good luck to you. What sparked my whole thought of uh, Magician's Graves again was a picture that I saw online just a couple days ago of uh, Steve Cohen from Chamber Magic, and he was out in, in Illinois. And while he, I, he, he had some shows in Chicago. And while he was in Illinois, he went to visit the grave of Max Molini. Uh, Max Molini is buried somewhere in Illinois. I think he's, I think I have it listed as well. It's, but he's in an unmarked grave. And that's what got me thinking about graves again, because I know there are a number of magicians who are in unmarked graves they couldn't afford a tombstone or whatever and 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 i also know that there are people in the magic community the probably more the magic collector community that have done fundraisers to raise money to get a gravestone or a marker for these uh, for different uh, different performers uh, one in particular that i'm thinking of right now well first off i really think we might want to do something for Max Molini. I mean, he's iconic in the world of magic history. So that would be a great person to, you know, do a fundraiser for and get a, a gravestone for him. Another one that I heard about was Frederick Eugene Powell. And now I know he's buried in the Chester Rural Cemetery in Chester, Pennsylvania. And I've got the plot number and everything, but I believe he's in an unmarked grave. I'm not 100% sure about that. I'm how about 99% sure about that. Folks like Powell and Molini, to me, I, I just think they deserve uh, a grave, a gravestone, a tombstone uh, that, you know, people can see 
Now, granted, I know a lot of people don't visit cemeteries, but so I know a lot of people go visit Houdini's grave, but come on, I, I, I love Houdini as much as the next person. He's not the only magician who ever died. There's a lot of other performers. I've been to Thurston's grave. I've been to Houdini's grave, Marjorie. She's not even a magician, for goodness sake. Uh, I've been to a lot of magicians' graves. So, uh, And there's still more that I'd like to... Uh, like to check out Harry Keller's grave. There's a story that I'll save for another time. But I just wanted to throw that out and see what maybe what your thoughts are. If you have thoughts about it, I don't know how to do these fundraisers uh, for the grave sites. So if somebody has an idea or or um, has done it before, maybe we can talk and see see about doing something for Malini or or Powell or or I don't know. Do you have to contact the remaining family members i don't know what the, i don't know what the process is so um let's check it out what do you say somebody out there want to take the first step that i think that would be great and now it's time for houdini radio my weekly look into the life of harry houdini um just to before i do this i want to just share with you over at my blog the magic detective.com uh, last year, 2017, and again, uh, a couple years before that, I did something called that I called Houdini Month. And last year, Houdini Month was basically a series of articles that I wrote throughout the month all about Houdini. And when I did it the time before that, uh, I, I want to say there were 30 or 31 articles. There may have even been more. I was cranking them out like a crazy person. And, uh, but last year I really liked some of the articles I had last year because some of them gave information that, uh, was new or certainly a lot fresher than, you know, things that people had read before. One of the things though, that was curious to me was uh, Queen Victoria's dress and Houdini. I had remembered in one of the, um, uh, one of the Houdini movies, actually the one with Paul Michael Glazer. There's a scene where Houdini sees Queen Victoria's dress in a window and he wants to buy it. And I was just curious. I was like, you know what? Did that, was that real? Did that really happen? Um, so I began to do the research on it. Now, Queen Victoria reigned over the British Empire for 64 years. She died, coincidentally enough, on Bess Houdini's birthday, January 22nd, 1901. And according to the Her Harold Kellogg biography, Houdini, His Life Story, Houdini was in London at that time, saw a dress designed for Queen Victoria in a shop window and wanted to buy it. So, okay, according to this book, seems like it was true. Houdini thought his, uh, after seeing the dress that uh, Queen Victoria and his mother must be about the same size, which uh, if you take a look at pictures of Queen Victoria and then pictures of Cecilia Weiss, you'll realized very quickly that they are not the same size. She was like a size 43, Queen Victoria. His mother was much, much smaller. Uh, but Houdini went into the shop and inquired about the dress, and they didn't want to sell it. Uh, I believe the exact quotes were, one did not sell Her Majesty's relics. But Houdini was very persistent and explained that the dress would be for his mother. And the shopkeeper eventually agreed with the condition that the dress not be worn in Great Britain. So Houdini did uh, get the dress. Now, you're probably wondering how much it cost. Now, I've read uh, it cost 50 pounds, it's 30 pounds. There are two different sources that say it was 30 pounds, so we're going with the 30 pounds. Uh, that would be Houdini, The Untold Story, has it as 30 pounds, and the Derek Tate book, which is the most recent book, The Great Houdini, His British Tours, also lists it as at 30 pounds. So that's what we're going to go with. Now, uh, one of the curiosities I had about the dress was the color. I imagined it was maybe like a midnight blue or even a deep purple. Uh, then I found out this little information. When Prince Albert died in 1861, Queen Victoria went into mourning and wore only black clothing. And she continued to wear only black cl clothing until the day she died. There were dresses that contained accents of white, uh, but again, um, it was just little accents of, of white. Queen Victoria was a big woman. I mentioned this before. Cecilia was not. Uh, there is a photo of uh, Cecilia wearing what is supposed to be Queen Victoria's dress. And you can tell there's a lot of extra fabric. Now, I did read that Bess helped to alter the dress to fit Houdini's mother. 
But if you look at the photo, it's uh, there's a lot of extra fabric there. Um, <clears throat> I think the actual photo of Queen Victoria's dress, I believe there are two photos of the dress, but the one that I'm fairly certain is the actual dress is a photo contained in the book Houdini, A Mind in Chains, and it says below the caption, Queen Victoria's Dress, Germany, 1901. I think that's, even though, it, you know, yeah, sure, it says it in the caption, I think that's actually the one. Now, this brings me to the whole reason I started this quest in the first place. I wanted to know, A, if the story was true, and B, where was the dress today? If truly was Queen Victoria's dress, then it must have survived. I wondered if Bess got it. In the movie, the Paul Michael Glazer movie, The Great Houdinis, um, with uh, Sally Struthers and Paul Michael Glazer, Harry asks Bess what she wants, and she replies quite emphatically, Queen Victoria's dress. Now, there's a psychological reason for that that doesn't ha actually have to do with the dress itself, but... Um, is stuck in my head. Okay, so the dress must still exist today. Well, I know where the dress is. I have found out. And this information uh, came from Harry Hardeen to John Oliver, from John Oliver to John Hinson, and then from John Hinson to me. So I'd say it's pretty accurate. The location of Queen Victoria's dress today Cecilia Weiss was buried in it. And just to add a little bit more trivia to that, Cecilia was also buried with a pair of slippers that Houdini purchased in Bremen. Uh, when Houdini was leaving on July 8th for Europe, his mother asked him to bring back a pair of the warm woolen house slippers. And this is according to Houdini, his life story by Harold Kellogg. Houdini stopped on his return voyage to specifically pick up slippers and be sure that she was buried with them. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. I want to remind you, if you're listening to us via iTunes, that you can subscribe to the podcast. We'd really appreciate it if you did that. And leave us a five-star review if you really like the, uh, the podcast. Of course, if you didn't like it, uh, don't leave a review, but contact me. Send me an email, info at carnegiemagic.com, and tell me what you liked or didn't like about the program. I'm always... Uh, open for suggestions. If you're listening through the website, which is magicdetectivepodcast.com, you can follow me there and you can leave a review there as well, or you can just like the particular podcast episodes. That'd be great. So we'll see you next week. Episode four, uh, I've been working on this rather diligently. I've got a story about Survey Leroy uh, that I think you're really going to like. So that'll be uh, on the next episode of the Magic Detective podcast. We'll see you next week.